All right, everyone, I want to welcome you all to today's webinar um, on teen mental health. And I want to thank the team from Hogue for being here with us once again. Superintendent Vital is also with us, and I would like to ask her just to say a few words of welcome to all of you. So hello, I want to welcome all of you today to our webinar. I'm so grateful to Hogue and for Dr. Sophia and the team from Hogue joining us today. You know, this has been a an unbelievable time for us as a school district and as a community. And I want to thank the team from Hogue for making time to be with us today. We felt this was a great topic to share with families we, as we work together to support our young people in these very challenging circumstances. I know there's a lot of anxiety, grief, a sense of loss as we move towards the last day of the school year. Our students are feeling all of this. And so are we. So it's a great time that we can all come together to support our students and each other as we work through and prepare for summer and the opening of the 2020-21 school year. Um, and in case anyone's wondering, we do not plan to start school in July. Um, while we don't know what school will look like next fall, we are building contingency plans and we'll be sharing our planning with families in the coming weeks and throughout the summer. So right now, let's focus on today and supporting our young people and please do enjoy the webinar. So we Thank began- you. Thank you for having us. We began this partnership with Hogue at the beginning of the school year and we had, we had four town halls planned and um, the virus had other plans. And what was interesting about this was that we had topics for the first three and we left this one sort of open and then realized within the last couple weeks that this was probably the perfect um, segue for the last, the last meeting with Hogue for this school year. And we wanted to focus specifically on what parents can do to support their children. Um, we have been doing a lot of stakeholder meetings with PTA groups, um, with principals, and we've been getting um, feedback from parents and from teachers about some of the stress that children are experiencing in the home. And some of it is due to the uncontrollable nature of the virus and, and sort of the fear around that. But then also trying to learn in a, a new environment where you're worried about your parents losing a job and um, where you're going to get food, um, how to pay the mortgage. Those are a lot of things that, that parents have been worried about and that children get to overhear in the homes while, while our teachers are trying to make sure that we continue teaching and learning too. So a really stressful time for everyone. Um, when we brought this topic up to Dr. Sinas, um, Safaya and Prerna and Amar, they were, they were thrilled to do this. And the way that we'll open it up today is we did take questions ahead of time. So it's just gonna be a Q and A format. I'll help moderate, but we wanna hear from our experts about how we can support our kids and, and um, as we move through the end of the school year and into the summer. So um, if you haven't met Dr. Cena before, he is the child and adolescent psychiatrist and program director at Aspire at Hogue. And um, he has been a great partner since we, we brought this idea to them last summer, along with Prerna Rao, who is a licensed marriage and family therapist and clinical manager at Aspire, and Amar, I'm not going to even try to say your last name, but uh, Fair I, enough. I know you've been to several of our, of our um, town halls, and he is also a licensed marriage and family therapist. I know they'll talk more about the Aspire program, maybe towards the end of this. Um, and parents, while you're listening, feel free to put in the Q&A section on the bottom of the Zoom call. If we do have time for additional questions, we can get to those. Um, is there, do you want to say anything to start at this point, Dr. Sina, um, Prerna, or Amar? Yeah, I wanted to yeah. thank, thank you all for uh, helping set this up. We definitely appreciate the continued collaboration. Um, we think it's vital uh, that, that uh, we continue um, informing the, our, our community, making sure that parents know that there is support out there. Um, not only when it comes to this virus, when it comes to like this global health crisis, but we're, we're talking about a potential mental health crisis as well. And it's already gotten to that point where unfortunately we've had even doctors, chief of medicine, 
at premier hospitals are committing suicide as a result of the overload from what they're experiencing and as a result of the virus itself. There's no doubt there's evidence coming out that coronavirus, COVID-19 can impact the brain and cause neurologic issues and even increased rates of depression. So that being said, that coupled with economic uncertainty, like you mentioned, Ryan, it, we're all under a ton of stress and human beings, we're, we're about routine and we're about um, certainty for the most part. And sometimes when that's thrown into a loop, when a wrench is thrown in our system the way this has, it causes major distress for a majority of our population. And I would say as a child psychiatrist, I treat adults too, but typically more young adults and teens. And there's no doubt in my practice, there's been a spike in mental health issues and even hospitalizations. I think in one 48 hour period, I had to hospitalize four or five kids a couple of weeks ago. And it just gives you an idea. That was about a month into this lockdown. The lockdown itself is creating a lot of tension, a lot of issues. And you can imagine uh, there's a lot of times with teens and parents, there's gonna be some tension regardless. But if, there's, if that's compounded by things like domestic violence or even possible abuse that's being perpetrated at home, you can imagine how that would be exaggerated and could lead to even more distress for these kids. Um, that's why I'm so thankful to our program. We're one of the few actually in Orange County that is remaining open. Um, pretty much every other program that we're aware of is shut down, but thankfully Hogue it's, uh, appreciates and you guys do too as a school district and as a community that these programs are vital. And I'm so appreciative to our team like Prina, Amar and the rest of our what I call frontline essential workers because they are they're risking their lives or risking their health to help out our children who are literally the most vulnerable in our society especially in this time of need I think the kids need a lot of support and perhaps even more the parents need tons of support because like you said they're not only parents and now being teachers and full-time guardians and we're going to talk about some strategies that parents can take to take a breather and get some respite from the stress because there's no doubt it's affecting everybody. Yeah, that's excellent. I know that when we met um, the first time with our PTA, oops, I think we're having some some technical difficulties. Maybe. Yeah, same here. Ryan, you're frozen. Maybe we can uh, we, we can continue and then run when Ryan comes back on we can continue the oh there's uh, Ryan okay perfect yeah it's just now telling me my internet connection is unstable and I think I know that <laughs> <laughs> um, what I was saying was when we met with our PTA presidents the the first time we expected to hear a lot about distance learning challenges and things like that but a lot of them brought to our attention um, just the the stress and anxiety in the home with with kids and, and what that looked and felt like and how much they needed support. So we're just really thankful that you're here um, to do this today. So if you're ready, I have some questions and, and we can get started. Yeah, I just wanna say a few words um, that I think a lot of parents need to hear. I think a situation like this has really um, put our resiliency as human beings to the test. Um, that's in true honesty. And I just wanna, this is just for the parents, is that you really are doing the best that you can. And you're trying to do the best you can to support your child and support yourself and your spouse and your home. So just know that whatever you're doing, you're doing the best that you can. And I say that even as a fellow parent, uh, as a working professional, as a therapist, as a fellow human being, that um, you're gonna make mistakes and that's okay. And you're just trying to get through this. So just know that don't be too hard on yourself before we you know go into the questions i just wanted to share that because i think um a lot of people are struggling with navigating you know am i making the best decision is, is this right what i'm doing um how do i know what's the best decision right now you know what's the sort of the process that i need to look at in terms of making the best decision you know for my family for myself for my kids so just know that whatever you're trying to do you're doing the best that you can so i just wanted to start by saying that to the parents especially yeah, and uh, just to piggyback off of that, I think Prana's right, because there really isn't a handbook on how to deal with the pandemic that's happening right now, and that most of us in our lifetime have not experienced this and having to socially kind of distance ourselves. But in that social distancing, one thing that I do want to remind people of is that there is still a community out there, and that community is still willing to help and be of aid, and that's why something like this is being put on. So I'm very grateful for you guys being able to put this together. 
Thank you. And you guys can write a handbook when we're all done with this. <laughs> so um, the first question is, how do I help my child who's feeling anxious and depressed during quarantine? Yeah, this is, this is such a, um, a common question that we're receiving. And I think as mental health professionals, we are also sort of asking, you know, how do you help your child feel less anxious and depressed in terms of what's um, going on? So I know Amar and I have our thoughts, but Dr. Sina, I'm sure you'd like to probably start in terms of the anxiety and depression, the depression that you're seeing. Yeah, so we, uh, there's no doubt parents need to have an open ear. We are both open ears. We got to uh, listen and empathize and support these children, especially especially now that they're they're so stressed out. I mean, you can imagine, especially with our seniors who are about to graduate, they're not even going to get the chance to go to prom or or end up going through graduation and whatnot. And even le let alone that, knowing what's going to happen next, when none of us actually knows what's going to happen next. But um, we want to make sure that parents are able to ask questions without overloading the child. Um, sometimes you got to find the right place in the right time. Otherwise, uh, especially teenagers, they're, they're going to shut down like a turtle and you're not going to get much information. One way we can get kids to open up sometimes is to, to incorporate like family activities. And that could be some, I would strongly recommend physical activity. Um, not only is it going to take up some time, it's going to add to the routine that is essential. I'm going to bring that word up over and over again because it's that crucial. All different types of routines, whether it's sleep, appetite, um, physical activity, I would recommend at least 30 minutes of exercise per day minimum per patient, preferably outdoor activity. That can help in multiple ways. One, we're all getting a little bit stir crazy being cooped up at home. It gives you an avenue to go outside and maintain that social distance, the six feet measures or maybe even more. Um, even if you're going outside on the beach or outdoors in your own community, walking around the neighborhood, going on jogs, hikes, swimming, if you have a pool at home or even in the ocean potentially, if, if that's the route you wanna go. What I'm getting at is we want to get some outdoor activity because A, the pollution levels are the lowest that they're ever going to be realistically. So it's really nice to get some of that fresh air in our lungs that we might not get that access in the future. Um, then perhaps even more importantly, there's tons of scientific evidence that supports uh, physical activity can be just as helpful for anxiety and depression, especially mild to moderate symptoms. When we're talking about 90 minutes of cardio per week, that's about 30 minutes every other day. There's 168 hours in a week. We can find 90 minutes and I would actually say 30 minutes to an hour per day would be even would be even better um, beyond the the neurotransmitters and the cat what are called uh, these neurotransmitters are the same that that antidepressants also release in your brain your large muscle groups release these same neurotransmitters that and endorphins that can go to your brain and actually help with anxiety and depression that's been proven through functional MRI imaging it's not just because Dr. Cena or other people think it's helpful for them there's actually real scientific literature and evidence that supports what I'm saying. On top of that, the vitamin D that hits our skin, it's gonna, or excuse me, the sunlight that hits our skin is gonna increase hopefully our levels of vitamin D that have also been evidence-based to help with mood issues, depression, anxiety, but especially during this time, um, I'm, I'm sure some of us have, have seen some of the literature and the news out there that vitamin C and vitamin D have been proven to help boost our immune system. So even more importantly, when it comes to during this COVID pandemic, we wanna help sure our immune systems are in check. I would say the sleep routines are just as important as the exercise. Sleep is rejuvenative. It's something that we crucially need, especially in times of stress. And for our immune system, sleep is, an, is, is ex extremely crucial as well. So I've had a lot of young people, especially teenagers who have become nocturnal or night owls now, and parents are giving them a little bit, maybe too much flexibility um, when it comes to not adhering to those routines. And of course, those kids are starting to suffer over time because they're waking up. And I had a couple of kids in this last week tell me they're waking up at two, three in the afternoon and then hanging out in bed all day until maybe even our program. And so they're getting no sunlight. And that's vital for when it comes to maintaining our um, melatonin and erection hormones, the wakefulness and the sleep hormones, um, on top of all the other issues that, that switching over to nocturnal sleep can, mm -hmm. can cause. And I'll leave it at this. There's evidence that supports this, and the WHO is recommending this too. For night shift workers, people who work the night shift, they definitely have an increased risk of cancer, especially things like lymphoma. And that's because our bodies were not designed and are equipped to be nocturnal. There's a reason why, and I, I remind kids, there's a reason why we don't have night vision. Like, it's because we weren't designed for this. And maybe 50,000 years ago, maybe even less, 5,000, 10,000 years ago, we didn't have electricity. So people were waking up at 7 in the morning when the sun came out and shutting down at 7 p.m. And we didn't have this 
this what we would perceive as a bizarre lifestyle the way we do now. And on top of that, we're very sedentary. And so we got to make sure that we're pushing back against our DNA, against our biology, so we can maintain our health, whether it's physical or mental. Yeah, I think just adding to that too is um, what you'll also see, and, and I can just speak from my observation um, from children too, is that anxiety and depression you know, can come in very different ways of how they express it. So if they're being a little bit extra clingy or if they are sort of um, refusing to engage in, in eating or um, like, they're, like Dr. Cena said, their sleep pattern is off, just sitting down and just being present with them and talking to them is gonna be really important. I think one thing to keep in mind is that for children and for teens especially, this is a really hard concept to understand in terms of what's going on. Like they understand that there's a pandemic, but in terms of how it's impactful, especially I think for adults where you have parents that from day to day have to decide, when am I gonna be able to make the next mortgage payment? Am I gonna have enough money to make the car payment this month? Is where you actually sit down with them and just hear them out and just talk to them and say, look, I understand, you know, there's a lot going on. Let's just talk through your fears and talk through what's going on. That can be really beneficial because a lot of the times, even us as human beings, we sort of get stuck in this feedback loop in our mind of these, of these constant negative thoughts that continue to happen over and over again. And sometimes just talking it out and being supportive can be really beneficial to them. Um, empathize as much as you can. And I would even say, you know, pick and choose your battles. That's a big one. Right now, I think, um, the regular situations outside of this, you know, parents would say, why is your room not clean? Why is this not happening? And I'm not saying, you know, let them live in a dirty room or not bathe or anything like that. I'm just saying, you know, sort of navigate around what can, you can sort of emphasize on and what you can let go of. Because I think in this situation, we literally all are trying to survive one day at a time to sort of get through this. And it's sort of creating a new norm or a new routine. So sort of pick and choose um, the situations that are coming up with your child and with your teen as well. I think uh, another thing to kind of take into effect is that during these years, these formative years, this is where they're starting to develop this opportunity to socialize, build trust with people, recognize, you know, some more of what's right and wrong. And so they're craving that socialization. And so right now in this time, of course, there's that anxiety and depression. They're not able to connect with people that they feel so close to and be able to talk to them and be able to kind of convey some of the stuff that they're going through and the feelings they're having. It is hard sometimes to kind of convey that to a parent, but being able to be validating and empathetic gives them that opportunity as well. But also knowing that we do have, although I'm not gonna go too much into detail with the technology piece right now, but I do think that since we do have access to things like this, Zoom, FaceTime, being able to use our phone to actually converse with someone, I think that's an opportunity to build on that to where they can actually utilize these channels so that they are still socializing to respect rather than they're just stuck in the home with the people who are living with them. There are avenues to be able to kind of engage further. Um, but that doesn't mean, I, I, I personally believe in the use of like Zoom and phone conversations versus like texting or through social media or anything like that. I think that it needs to be an avenue that's healthy where we're having a conversation versus a text battle, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I've noticed that even in our own home where our, our kids' friends will actually make plans to get on Zoom or a Google yeah. Hangout, and it's so important for them just to even see each other's faces, mm -hmm. and we hear that a lot mm -hmm. with other kids, so I, we would definitely encourage that. And we want to encourage that for the adults too, for the parents at times to get their own respite care, to have their own potentially virtual happy hour. I know I have one set up yeah. at 8 p.m. tonight with all of my med school buddies from Texas. So it's going to, so what's nice is that I'm connecting to some of these, some of my buddies from back in the day that we haven't actually had that face to face interaction in maybe 14, 15, 16 years. Yeah. Um, so a, there is a silver lining where we're, although we're maintaining that social distance and some other ways, we're actually getting closer. And sometimes times of stress, tragedy if you want to call it that they bring people closer together and so we there are also there are silver linings in this um yeah which that we need to utilize i think uh dr cena kind of brings up a good point too because i personally i'm a recent parent my daughter is two years old and it it did create some difficulty to be able to socialize with my friends overall especially in person over the last month i have been interacting with my friends so much more via zoom we've been playing games via zoom and it's been very productive in the sense that we've been rekindling those relationships and building on them again. So 
I think that it is, this is an awesome opportunity to be able to do that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so a situation where maybe a student or an adult has cut off social ties, what is that, what are, what are those yeah. signs mean? So signs of, so when, when a kid is starting to become more reclusive, more withdrawn, whether it's with their friends, I mean, that's usually a, a, a classic red flag that we gotta uh, uh, potentially get outside support if we're noticing a child is not only becoming more withdrawn and isolative with their friends, but also at home and maybe isolate themselves more of their room. And it's usually a progressive worsening of that. Um, something that needs to get checked. And we need to, at times, figure out um, if we need, again, that outside support to, to investigate what's going on. At times, parents will try to do their own investigation and, and, and be inquisitive and ask questions and kids may shut down. So we wanna make sure that we're, these kids are not only happy and healthy, but they all seem to be functional. So if they're becoming, if they're starting to have issues with what are called ADLs, activities of daily living, meaning they're not showering, they're not brushing their teeth, they're not leaving the room, they're staying in bed all day, every day, these are classic signs of depression. And we don't want to get to a point where that depression and what's called anhedonia, like losing pleasure and fun activities and whatnot, can over time lead to worsening depression. And God forbid, can lead to things like uh, passive or even active suicidality, where kids start scheming different ways to hurt themselves. and at times even what we deal with that aspires not only that but also self injurious behavior obviously if your child is starting to hurt themselves scratching cutting stuff like that those are other red flags coupled with some of the isolation that are that means we need to do some deeper investigation whether it's with a therapist psychologist psychiatrist thankfully mental health as such where different than other specialties we can utilize telemedicine telehealth in my opinion it's not ideal but it's definitely better than the alternative and so like we have like we've already had some thank we won't we've only had one technical difficulty during this zoom call but i i would guess we're gonna have another one or two before the end of this conversation i know it happens in my phone calls all the times uh, and uh, video sessions with patients so that sometimes throws a, a wrench in what we're trying to do but it is a better situation than not having access to care and thankfully a lot of therapists i know psychiatrists are accepting face-to-face -face video sessions um, and thankfully the u.s government and the administration has uh, brought down some of the barriers when it comes to um, access to care, especially when it comes to lowering the HIPAA rules. So we don't have to worry so much. If like, let's say this call didn't, th I was using Zoom, it went down, I could switch over to FaceTime, where before FaceTime and Zoom may have not been HIPAA compliant, now they are, yeah. um, because they're, they're technically encrypted anyway. So it should be fine in that regard. And ultimately we wanna, we want people to know that they don't have to go into a doctor's office. They don't have to have a fear of going um, into a hospital and maybe getting this virus potential, although the risk of that is low. Even at Aspire, we're having the, the temperature scanners and we're doing all types of screening before kids come into the program. Um, but we wanna be as thorough as we can when it comes to safety and that includes um, what we're doing for these FaceTime sessions. So I'm glad that the government's allowed us, even as doctors, to practice across all state lines. Technically, I'm only supposed to practice in California because I only have a me California medical license. But now, because of the pandemic, they've lowered those restrictions, and now we can technically uh, treat people all around the country. I've actually had several patients from, from around the country, the East Coast, um, up in Washington as well, hit me up recently to set up some appointments, which I, my practice, I, I w I'd rather maintain what I'm doing here and, and service our community, but it's nice that we have that flexibility um, if we need to treat people outside of our state lines. Yeah, and I think it's important for everyone to hear that that's still going on and still an option too. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, this parent wants to know how do I ease my own worries about letting my kids go back to socializing with friends? That's a great question. Go ahead. That's a really good question. So, and I think this is where, um, and Dr. Cena, you mentioned this, is, is, is in life, everything is sort of a cost benefit analysis when it comes to the situation as well. And I think you have to make the most informed decision based on the information that you have and seeing the situation in your home. So whether it's, and Dr. Cena, you can probably speak further on this, is if you have someone that's sick at home and you have to be more cautious about sort of getting back to the normal, whatever normal looks like routine in life. And if that could possibly expose someone else, depending on the situation, you have to be a little bit more cautious about that um, versus someone that doesn't have someone that's sick at home or everyone else is healthy. And that's sort of um, 
increase in possibly affecting that individual is a little bit lower than someone that is sick. So you have to look at those situations when it comes to making the best decision of sort of reducing your anxiety when it comes to getting back to sort of the norm. I know um, there's a lot of conflicting information that comes out at times, whether it's like, can I do this? Can I not do this? Is it okay for me to go here? Is it not okay for me to go here? So I would say start slow and go over what's necessary for you to do for your day-to-day -day activities and sort of ease into your transition that way. I know for me, it's more so like getting gas, going to the grocery store and everything else, if it's not necessary, can really wait. And as um, places start opening up, you can sort of, sort of identify, is it necessary for me to go here or is it not? To so sort of ease your fears and transition yourself slowly back um, into sort of the regular you know, day-to-day -day sort of mundane life that we have. Dr. Sina, I don't know if you have anything to add to that too. Yeah, I would say it's gonna be a case-by-case -case basis. Like Prina said, every family is gonna have different vulnerabilities. So for instance, I, I'll, I'll throw out a personal anecdote. My dad is relatively healthy, but recently he developed this lung infection outside of COVID. And so he's on steroids, so he's immunocompromised, let alone having asthma for, for decades. So he's particularly vulnerable given his age and his comorbidity, his medical issues. My sister who goes in and out of the house sometimes, they all live in Texas. She's a dentist, she's a pediatric dentist. She's in people's mouths basically all day, every day. So she's one of the highest risk uh, people along with anesthesiologists who are intubating for getting COVID from patients. And so unfortunately in my household, my sister's not going to my parents' house at all, like under any circumstance. And my dad even called me the other day and was like, is there any way, do me a big favor. If you love me, call your sister and tell her to come into the house. I'm like, no, dude, if I love you, she can't come into the house. Like it's the exact opposite recommendation. And so for my household, it's a no brainer. Like dad has four or five different risk factors. He's got to stay super safe where let's say dad was 20, 30 years younger and was super healthy. He's much less at risk than he is now. And so the reason I'm even bringing a dad into the mix is because these kids technically are way less vulnerable to COVID than parents are. So the parents, I don't want them to worry too much about COVID affecting the kids. It's actually the way that COVID, if they, because most kids are going to be asymptomatic and then they're going to bring it back to the household. And then you may have a mom, dad, grandfather, uncle, aunt, someone who has a lot of, uh, either some illnesses or is you know, immunocompromised and they're going to be the ones that are actually at higher risk. So that's going to dictate how much flexibility we give to a child. And that's something that we're going to have to sit down and have a frank conversation with that kid that I know that your friends are able to go in and out of the house, maybe with more flexibility than you do, but there's a rhyme and reason why. And hopefully if they're not able to understand that we can even get other parents involved and their friends and try to uh, kind of figure out a balanced approach where these kids do have, uh, access to other kids and are able to socialize without making the families, their own family members more vulnerable. You know, the antibody testing that's coming out could be something that could alleviate some parents' fears as well. I believe Quest now, is, it's a $120 test that anyone can order online. You don't have to have a doctor's note. And there are some, I believe the state of California, I think the LA County is actually giving out free antibody testing to anybody. So it depends on the county and, and the city you live in too. But sometimes that testing can help alleviate um, parents' concerns as well. Um, I would also ask that, that parents stay in constant contact with the family members and the parents of the kids that their own children are socializing with so we can find out where those parents are coming from and how strict they are when it comes to adhering to these social distancing measures. If those parents are free for all and, and like let's say going to uh, thankfully no baseball stadiums or basketball or, or football <laughs> arenas are open, but let's say they were, that's probably not the best person to be hanging out with because they're going to be at higher risk realistically than, than some others who are taking it a little bit more seriously. Um, but um, honestly, the, the good news is that it doesn't affect kids as much as it does adults. And there is some evidence that some, a handful of children have developed what's called, I believe, Kawasaki syndrome. It's like a, a, um, a blood vessel disorder. Um, but that, the risk of that is super low. And so in the grand scheme of things, these kids are actually going to prevail and not have as many issues as some of our adult counterparts. I mean, the only other thing I would add, really, Dr. Cena kind of addressed everything. Um, 
is that it's really going to be important for the families to be honest too. I mean, we're all in this as, as community members. We're all in this together. We want to get through this. And the best way to do that is as long as we're staying honest with one another, this gives us that opportunity to be able to possibly socialize more or at least even develop that trust so that I know if someone else is going out or if they're interacting with other people, I know that, you know, I need to possibly be a little more cautious and stay at home. But if I also know that they're being honest with me and they're not interacting as much, then this gives me an opportunity to socialize and build some relationship, possibly even bring, um, you know, our child to, our children to interact so that they have someone to socialize with as well. Yeah. You know, know, like I went to, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I was just going to say, I want to piggyback on what you said, Preen, about how the cost-benefit analysis, there is a cost to lock, shutting down completely and never leaving the house. It, the, I mean, we're, most human beings, a huge majority are social creatures. So like this is affecting our mental health, which in itself is going to affect our medical health too in multiple ways. So we, again, we, we can't be locked down forever. At the same time, we got to find a nuanced, balanced approach where we kind of ease back into uh, hoping a, 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 a semblance of normalcy, which is going to happen sooner than later. Um, I I'm hoping over the summertime um, with the heat going up, the sunlight itself, in, in theory, is a disinfectant in a lot of ways with these viruses. The transmissibility, in theory, should not be as, as bad as it's been. Um, and there's a lot of evidence as these things, as these viruses mutate, they over time mutate and get weaker, the way SARS did 15, 17 years ago. These viruses don't usually mutate and get stronger. They usually do the opposite. So over time, as they go through each human being, they're getting an increased risk of mutating and usually getting weaker and less virulent. So there, there are things in our favor along with the vaccines coming out, which seems like we have a handful that are um, getting good results in clinical studies. So I'm hopeful along with that and then uh, that one newer drug, the experimental drug called remdesivir. These are other uh, treatments that are definitely helping reduce not only contracting the illness, but potentially helping mitigate the symptoms with some of these new treatments. So there's a lot of positivity. There are, there's a light at the end of this tunnel that I want to remind parents that we're not going to be stuck forever. And that's something they need to remind their kids too. This is not a, this is not our new, new normal. Things will get back to normal at some point. I can't tell you when and, and where, but um, hopefully sooner than later. And I just want to say, you know, it, I know it, it can be strange to ask parents like, have you been around anyone? Has your family members been around anyone that's possibly been exposed? I mean, I know it could be weird to ask that question, um, but this is sort of the new norm. So really knowing where your, your child is and who they're hanging out with, um, it's sort of something that, that should be addressed. I think it's sort of very similar to the question of, you know, when your child goes over to someone's house, is there a responsible adult there? Are you gonna be monitored? Are you gonna be supervised? What are you guys gonna be doing? That's sort of part of now, in a strange way, the questionnaire that we had, the question that we have to add to our questionnaire when we talk to these families too is, has anyone been exposed? Do you know, you know, are you sick? You know, where are you, you know, are you, you know, trying to practice social distancing? So I know as strange as it may sound um, to ask those things, but I also think it's important to ask those things uh, sure. because we're all trying to protect each other. And that's what it comes down to at the end of the day. And it's better, I agree, it's better to have a, a slightly uncomfortable conversation and God forbid, find out after the fact, seven days, 10 days later that you contracted that illness yeah. and potentially could have prevented it. You know, the good news is technology is definitely coming through in multiple ways and where we can do contact tracing. From what I heard, Apple and Google have anonymous contact tracing where they're gonna be able to, with Bluetooth, the way the, the devices can get close to each other, they can communicate over time, we can find out who has the illness and who doesn't. Um, and so that's another way that we're gonna have better uh, information than we do now. So there are, there's a lot of positive, um, uh, positive ways to mitigate these issues in the pipeline. And I'm hopeful that those come online sooner than later mm -hmm. to alleviate some of our, I mean, I know we're all worried as, we're all worried as human beings regardless. So it's something that we gotta, um, the more information we have, although that being said, the caveat is too much information can be an issue too. So I wanted to bring that up before I forget. We don't wanna have information overload. If you notice yourself as a parent or your child, you're watching too much news, like when you, like whether it's CNN or MSNBC or Fox News or any of the, the TV networks or social media, Instagram, TikTok, um, Facebook, if these things are creating a lot of anxiety, then we need to start lowering that as well. And there is, there is such thing as, getting overloaded. I know when, I, when I'm, I'm able to thankfully distract myself throughout the day with, um, with patient care, but then by the evening, 
if I get sucked into this rabbit hole, it's, it's hard to pull yourself out. Once you start watching something, it, it, it leads to researching more and more and you, you end up actually freaking yourself out, even being a medical professional and, and knowing that there's a lot of potential misinformation out there. Yeah, that's horrible. I finally had to get myself to put the phone down and grab some. Yeah. I'm an English major, so I just grabbed some of the old classics and started reading. There you go, with Charles no Dickens. <laughs> Whatever it takes. <laughs> lose time, and all of a sudden you're like, what in the world just happened? Mm -hmm. So another um, parent is asking um, for help for a high schooler to deal with disappointment, missing prom, graduation, and other end of school events. And I know that we're not just dealing with that in as seniors, which is probably the worst because of because of the great milestone of heading off to college, but also our fifth graders going into sixth grade, our kindergartners, um, our eighth graders going into high school. So I know a lot of families are, are sort of feeling this, this sense of loss. There's no, it, it is a sense of loss and it's, 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 it's really sad. It's unfortunate that things have to happen like this. Um, you know, what we have to do is we, again, we need to empathize. Sympathy and empathy are different. Empathy is putting yourself in someone else's shoes. Sympathy is like feeling sorry. I mean, sometimes we have to do a combination of the two. And I think as parents, we probably will do our best to empathize. We're also going to sympathize and try to do our best to validate these kids' feelings. Um, I think that's, that's crucial that we, we can let them know that we appreciate how they're feeling, that this is something that was never planned. Ideally, none of us would want this to happen. Um, and so thankfully, some school districts, and I've heard some communities are trying to set up maybe like a, a, a prom or even like a graduation outdoors um, to commemorate and have a commencement at some point in the next couple months before these kids go off to college or let's say before they go up from fifth grade to, to middle school or middle school to high school, just so we can have a continuity and also let these kids know that we do support them, that we do feel for them, and that we do want them to, to be acknowledged because these are milestones that do need to be acknowledged and that these kids, I think, once they, once they realize and appreciate that not only are we doing our best to try to help them out at home in this community setting, the whole community is in this together and uh, we're gonna, we got their back. And so I'm, I'm hopeful with uh, whether it's like going to the beach whether it's an outdoor activity. The reason I keep bringing up outdoors is because obviously when you're outside, the risk of this virus transmitting is gonna be lower, especially if you're maintaining some distance. So if, if there's a lot, let's say you're on the beach and there's a lot of wind and whatnot, the risk of contracting something peer to peer as long as you're not too close to each other is relatively low. And so as the virus, hopefully as in the next couple of months, we see cases going further down over time, I think as a community, as school district, as schools themselves, they'll, they'll feel more comfortable, hopefully setting up these backup plans to let these kids know that we have their back. I think another thing to kind of note in all of this is that, so you do want to practice empathy, you want to validate what they're going through and kind of be able to be in their shoes and understand it. And by no means do I want parents to kind of go around and say, well, get over it and things will just get better and whatnot. But I do want to kind of encourage that we ask our teens to be open-minded because in this time, we don't want people to get so kind of stuck and complacent in what's going on that they become closed-minded to experiences that do come up. So kind of asking them to just be open to possibilities that things do get better and that things will come about and that we will be able to engage in different activities rather than, you know, being too hyper-focused on something that was missed out just recently. Um, so just giving that open-minded approach rather than, again, like being complacent. I agree. And I would say for, for families that do have, let's say, uh, members at home that are immunocompromised, that they, we could at, at minimum set up like a, a dinner or an outing, something just with the family to, to help commemorate moving in that transition from one stage of life to the next. Um, just to let these kids know that we know that we can't have you socialize with the other kids and maybe have, be in this big group setting but we're gonna do our best to make sure that you are acknowledged, that, that, we, that we do appreciate what you've done and that we, we're here with you now and we're gonna be here with you in the future when you go on to that next step. I think what I've seen is a lot of, um, you know, people trying to be creative and think outside the box when it comes to commemor commemorating um, these major milestones. I know even in my neighborhood, um, recently we had um, a family and 
friends just sort of drive by in a car with posters and balloons just to commemorate a birthday even and even mm -hmm. to commemorate a graduation. So I think, you know, we have to sort of get a little bit creative when it comes mm -hmm. to that. And also empathize with your teen like this is really hard for them that that milestone is something you know they've been working towards for 12 years of school of education and i think you know to to sort of have that taken away from you can really be disheartening um yeah. and so let your in some ways i would say you know if your teen is feeling sad you know let them experience let them be sad for a little bit but also monitor that obviously we don't want them to get too heavily depressed um to get really dark thoughts when it comes to that too where you know that sort of you know with teens thinking very black and white they'll think well this is how life will always be and this is how disappointment will feel all the time and it's like it's not necessarily the case i think you know all of us were not expecting something like this so for me having a kindergartner at home who is kind of lost in the shuffle trying to understand well I'm, am i going back to kindergarten am i going to see my friends or am i going to first grade and trying to help talk through that discussion of what that looks like um, is obviously going to be age appropriate in terms of where your child is uh, but also letting them know that difficult situations are temporary and difficult situations pass and this is where you take into account maybe have talking to your teen about a creative idea of how they can commemorate it Although graduation was, you know, canceled or delayed, what would they like to do, you know, when things start opening up that they, you guys can do together as a family or with friends or something that's still safe, uh, but also still acknowledges their hard work and dedication too. Mm -hmm. And I agree with Prana 100% on that. I mean, being creative, this is where the community has an opportunity to come together and work together to kind of create that for teens. I mean, like even having a graduation car procession going through the parking lot at the school where everyone's kind of in their caps and gowns and just waving and just being a part of something is really important in that situation too. So just having that creativity to allow for that is something that we should work together towards. Yeah, I know for us, the door is still open to actually having a real graduation on June 4th, but it's all going to depend on the guidelines and restrictions. Mm -hmm. And so, right. you know, at this point, it looks unlikely. Um, we have set aside a date at the end of July that we would do a, a out, an outdoor real graduation if it's possible. And if it has to be smaller groups, splitting it up into, into different times of the day and things like that. But we do realize how important it is, especially for our seniors, to commemorate that time and send them off on their way to their next big adventure. Um, this, this next one is that my high schooler no longer wants to go away to college and instead now wants to go to community college to stay close to home in case of another pandemic. Is this healthy? Should I encourage them to go to school as we previously planned? You know, this is going to be a case by case basis too. I get this question a lot b way before COVID. I, I say BC is before COVID <laughs> and AC is after COVID. So in BC, I've had a lot of qu kids ask this question and parents are like, do you think my kid has the maturity level to go off out of state and go to a four year program? And sometimes the answer is no, they're just not there yet. The, just because, let's say that kid is really high IQ, doing great academically, but emotionally they're struggling big time. Either, whether it's related to their coping skills or dependency, uh, sorry, or their depression, anxiety. Um, sometimes their resiliency uh, skills just are not what they need to be. Um, those kids actually may benefit staying in state, local, so they have family support, sometimes therapy support, sometimes psychiatrist support um, to make sure that they're, that they're happy and healthy. And then once they get their general ed classes in the community college, and sometimes they do actually way better um, in community college, getting sometimes a 4.0 GPA and then going off to like a UC school, for instance, and doing great. Um, getting some of that maturity under the belt, getting more treatment if necessary, being in a better place overall so they can move on to that, that higher level of education. Um, I've had a handful of doctor friends who went to community college first and then transferred over to UCs. And I mean, it doesn't, going to community college shouldn't, in my opinion, at least be seen as like a huge negative or something that like as, as, a, that, as a child that wasn't able to make it. If anything, sometimes it has, helps um, when it comes to, to success um, more than they would have otherwise. I want you guys to remember too, going back to, um, I went to University of Texas in Austin, one of the biggest schools in America, 40,000 plus undergraduates. That school, like most other major schools, the first couple of years are weed out classes. So like you have three, 400 kids in a class, 
they're actually expecting a quarter of these kids to drop out or leave. Where in community college, the class sizes are much smaller. And mm -hmm. in some ways, you may even have more support because you do have access to your own family and um, being able to at minimum go home for a, an occasional meal and stuff like that or going home or having parents visit you more often if, if necessary. Those things can be really vital when we're talking about a kid who's going from high school to college, especially in a huge time of uncertainty like a pandemic. So I don't want parents or kids to see community college as a major deficit. And in some ways it could actually be a huge positive. And I've seen that happen time and time again with my own friends and family. And I've seen it happen with patients as well who, who prevailed and done really well. And I had one patient who didn't even think she could get into any UC school. She went to community college, did really well. Now she's, I believe at UCI. And I think she's applying to medical school now. So if you asked her four years ago what her, her game plan was, because of community college, she was convinced that the doors were all closed for her. If anything, it may have opened up more doors because she, she had a lot of stressors and a lot of issues that she needed to work on that wouldn't yeah. have not, would have not been realistically rectified um, far away from home and across state lines. Yeah. Oops. Yeah, I think you're, you're on mute. mute. Yes, of course. I've noticed my child is spending <laughs> too much time playing video games. How much is too much, especially during this time? Dr. Cena, this is all you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I think kids love when I answer this question. And by love, I mean abhor. They hate it because usually I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm pretty strict when it comes to technology. Not, and I love technology. I'm a huge gadget guy. Like I, I, I think it's vital for our futures. Obviously, it's, it's integrated into all of our lives. But just like anything else in this life, we've got to find a balance. And the studies are showing, at least for social media, that two, three hours a day should be a cutoff. The, the, the evidence is out there that, with, at least with social media, three, more than three hours a day can lead to a definitive increase or a significant increase in uh, depression and anxiety symptoms. Um, along with other studies, uh, these are major studies coming out of like the world's premier journals like Lancet and JAMA. Um, these are some of the, again, some of the world's best journals and they're, they're reiterating what I'm recommending to parents, which is every hour spent on social media can lead to uh, increased risk of self-esteem issues and depression. You could say with video games, the self-esteem may not be affected as much, but there's no doubt social media, just like other forms of technology along with video games can be highly addictive. You release dopamine in your brain, which is a neurotransmitter that reinforces these, these pathways that can lead to addiction and even withdrawal when kids are taken away from their video games. So these kids need to know in advance that there is a limit. We do wanna be flexible, I'd say, because of this pandemic, and like Prina and, and Amar and myself have recommended multiple times today, that we do need to recognize that this is a very, very unusual, hopefully once in a lifetime situation. So I want parents to practice more flexibility than usual, but that flexibility has its limits too. Like we don't, that doesn't mean you're, you're free for all where I've had some kids playing. I had one kid tell me he played 10 hours per day. And I'm like, where are your parents? Like, why is there no regulation here? I know there's a pandemic, yeah. but, and I know you're bored, but pick up a book, pick up something, do go outside. There's so many other things we can do to relieve our boredom. Um, I had one kid telling me he was self-injuring and cutting himself because he was bored. And I was like, for the love of God, let's find some other coping strategy that's going to be more productive and, and, and less harmful. Um, but, you know, that being said, I would try to admit it. If we can, usually with kids, positive and negative reinforcement help the best. So holding a big stick and a big carrot from both sides can be beneficial. So I would say if we, these kids really want to push the boundaries, we need to come up with a game plan in advance, maybe even with a written contract where parents and the child themselves um, hopefully can come to a, a consensus. And sometimes we need an outside party like myself or, or a therapist to help out with that, that for every 30 minutes or hour that's spent outdoors, you get some more flexibility, meaning a physical activity, you get more flexibility with video games indoors. And sometimes that can be, again, a po using positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement that if you don't exercise, potentially an hour of video games or whatever limit a family is going to set is going to be taken away. And so I that think, limit is going to be different for each family. Yeah. And depending on how addictive, the, how addicted the kid is already to video games um, and how comfortable the family is setting those boundaries. And I want to remind parents and I remind kids all the time that video games, technology, TVs, laptops, iPads, cell phones, most importantly, cell phones 
are not human rights. These are all privileges that can be taken away if the privileges are taken advantage of. So for instance, I have some kids who think that holding onto their phone at night is a human right and it's just not. Like if anything, it's a major vulnerability and it's a risk factor for doing nefarious things at night. And beyond that, maybe even more importantly, depending on the kid, can leading to sleep hygiene issues that can over time be compounding and cause major issues with depression and anxiety. So I have a lot of kids, unfortunately, staying up till two, three in the morning. Typically they're on technology and they, they rebut that, oh, well, I have the, the, the sleep, uh, what is it, the, the blue light filter on. I'm like, no, there's actually more evidence coming out that the yellow light, even with the filter, also blocks the production of melatonin let alone you're watching YouTube, you're playing video games, you're watching something entertaining, it's gonna release more dopamine and norepinephrine, especially if it's something exciting or violent like a shoot 'em up game. That's gonna get your body in a fight or flight mode that's gonna prevent you from being able to shut down easier. Those kids also have a lot of issues, especially the, a lot of my adolescent males who are playing a lot of shoot 'em up games, first person shooter games, those FPS games. Um, you can imagine that there's a disparity between the anxiety and the tension you feel in your head versus what's dispelled in your body. And so in, the, in your mind, whether it's VR or AR or playing a video game, you're activated, but your body isn't able to release some of that tension because you're sedentary. So we got to figure out a way to, to find that balance where there's not such a huge disparity between being sedentary and activated. And that can over time lead to things like aggression and acting out, and sometimes even worse, depression and suicidality. Um, so we want to check these things and nip these things in the bud before they become full-blown addictions. Also, you know, keep in mind that that I understand even during video games that they typically chat with friends as well, um, mm -hmm. you know, or schedule hangouts or play together, and that's how they communicate with their friends too. And and that's okay. And now now more than ever, we're also encouraging that that social connection as well. But at the same time. You know, when you have rules like you need to be home by nine or you have you can hang out with him for three hours or two hours or her, whatever that is, um, try to keep those that same structured rule if possible, even if their friends are chatting on on video games as well. I think it's really important to still maintain some structure if you can um, in terms of what's going on. And I know, you know, we get this question, too, is. Well, does screen time also um, fall into the category of when they have to be on Zoom for school and have to do papers and all of that as well? And I think that's that um, obviously can affect them too because now it's more more stress from what we are hearing from a lot of our teens is I now have to schedule my breaks and then turn in my papers and log into my class and all of that as well. So this is where we are we're really encouraging take time to make time to be outdoors, at least 30 to 45 minutes, get out, disconnect from a lot of this media, technology, you know, information overload that you're being um, sort of bombarded with and just sort of reconnect with yourself too. And I know some people will say, well, did they connect? Should they not have that social interaction? Again, everything is in moderation. And obviously if your teen is sitting in their room on the video game, talking for hours, that's not something that we recommend. We do recommend taking a break, coming downstairs or upstairs or, or one story house, wherever you live, eating, sleeping properly, getting exercise, spending time and doing the activity as a family. Again, creating some sort of structure or normalcy as best as you can within the home, within the confine, confinements of your home as well um, to help your team feel somewhat uh, regulated. Yeah. And I would even pick, recommend, I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was gonna say uh, real quickly, um, we could even get like a whiteboard. Sometimes they come with like the monthly, the dates on them. And so we can start setting a struct, having a structured schedule for these kids, whether it's weekly or monthly. So they know they have something to potentially look forward to, but also that they're gonna be kept in check and that they need to be held accountable. And like most human beings, but especially young people, they benefit most with structure, whether they wanna believe it or not, Time and time again, I know as adults, we, we, we've noticed that we do best with structure, kids even more so with their developing young brains and, and the impulsivity that comes and the immaturity that comes with, with adolescence. We gotta make sure that we're giving them that scaffolding because otherwise things unravel and fall apart pretty quickly. Like a lot of, a lot of kids that I've talked to recently that, that, that sleep hygiene has gone out the window like completely. And that's, I blame the parents for that. Like if you give, if you get, if you give a child an inch when it comes to, some leeway and flexibility, they're gonna take a thousand miles, especially when it comes to sleep and shutting down at night. 
I think another thing to kind of note too is that we want to be able to disrupt certain patterns too. So if a teen is like participating in gaming that's going on way too long, I, mm -hmm. I personally would disrupt it and create where it's like, okay, they're playing maybe hour, hour and a half, and then we schedule another hour and a half later in the day, and then also limit it to like a certain time where they have to stop, like 10, 11 o'clock, this is done, no more. Hard cut like, off. Exactly, mm -hmm. but we want to disrupt that pattern too, because as they're kind of getting involved in that, I feel like that agitation Dr. Cena was talking about, a little bit of anxiety, when we're playing three, four hours, and then all of a sudden the system is shut off, that's gonna portray in the way that they're mm -hmm. acting, they're behaving towards the family members, so I do think that it needs to be disrupted at different points. I also think we need to get down back to basics, like engaging in pleasant activities that we haven't done in a long time. Um, we, you know, like board games, card games, things that we can all kind of do together at home around the family and just kind of be back at enjoying that. Doing a movie night every so often where everyone's together and phones are turned in and we're doing that too. So getting back down to those basics before these were so accessible. Um, one of the things that our teens do sometimes in our program that everyone just is so hesitant and so reluctant to participate in is blowing bubbles outside but it becomes so innocent and so enjoyable that everyone starts laughing and kind of being part of a group that's just doing something that's fun and they always reminisce about when they were children so yeah. again getting back down to basics yeah and i would say part of those basics would be like we recommended earlier too to do some physical activity together as a family whether it's like a light sports game even things like kickball and whatnot <laughs> um versus I've, I've had a lot of i've been recommending to families thankfully a lot of families do have bicycles at home biking is a great activity even as a family because you are maintaining that social distancing it does get your heart rate up um it's usually people have an easier time biking than they do especially on your joints compared to like running or jogging um, it's something that you can do more leisurely. So it's something that if we could um, incorporate as part of the family routine where parents aren't just like these um, authoritarian figures in the sky telling the kids to do everything, you incorporate yourself into the mix. And then that means you're holding yourself accountable and you're also getting your own vitamin D and getting your own fresh air in your lungs and whatnot, which is just as vital to parents as it is to the kids. You mentioned a lot about sleep um, within that too. So another question we got was um, just helping kids who are now anxious about sleep or waking up in the middle of the night, um, not getting good sleep during the night or maybe not a consistent sleep. Um, how do you help with those sort of bedtime routines and the anxiety of even just going to bed? It's a great question. So the, those routines are important and, what, and that routine doesn't start when five minutes before you put your head on the pillow. It starts hours in advance, two, three hours before technically. There's evidence out there that you're not supposed to exercise about three hours before shutting down because you do have those feel good neurotransmitters like dopamine and nor norepinephrine that are activating and these are gonna wake up your brain as well. So you wanna try to refrain from especially strenuous exercise right before bed. I've had a handful of patients tell me the opposite, that it helps them sleep, but that's far and few between. Um, the other thing that we want to reinforce is relinquishing, like we brought up earlier, the phones at night, because that goes hand in hand with not having gadgets in the room, because the, the light that's coming off the screen, that blocks the production of melatonin in this part of your brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. There's like, it's, I go into detail sometimes to let people know that there's like scientific evidence that supports it. It's not just because Anecdotally, it helps some people and doesn't help others. Um, but uh, helping ways to mitigate that melatonin, um, whether it's with supplementation, sometimes I recommend patients get over the counter, under the tongue um, melatonin. There's a really good brand that I've had several patients and friends, colleagues, doctors come back and tell me that's beneficial. I'm not, a, I'm not endorsing this product, but, it, but branding for supplements is a little bit more important than it is for prescriptions because there is no FDA regulation. So when you see one milligram melatonin, there's a chance it's 0 0.01 milligram and there's no regulation against that. But I would recommend if you're gonna go down that melatonin route that you you get an under the tongue tablet or liquid that's not gonna, that you don't swallow. So it gets absorbed through your sublingual gland and goes into your bloodstream a lot faster. Some studies show up to 30 times faster distribution um, or onset of, of action compared to if you're just swallowing it. Cause you have to imagine it goes through your GI system and takes some time to activate. When you do under the tongue melatonin, it also leaves your system faster because it kicks in faster. And so there's a less chance of residual over sedation. I would start with one milligram and go up progressively to five milligrams, usually at most if necessary. That's something that you can take as needed or scheduled for 
several weeks, maybe even months, I wouldn't recommend it every single day for the rest of your life because it is a sleep hormone that could disrupt that that balance, so to speak. But obviously the balance is already off if you're needing to supplement with that. So that's one other strategy. And then again, the um, having a cutoff for video games, for technology, and switching over to like magazines, newspaper, books to help shut down at night would potentially be effective too. And at some point, if sleep is a major problem, and this, I, ideally you want kids to sleep about eight hours plus per night. Every hour l less sleep they're getting, there's a, there's a distinct decrease in focus and coping and increase in anxiety and depressive symptoms. So we wanna make sure that they're sleeping well every night. If they're not, sometimes you need to resort to following up with either your pediatrician, primary care doctor, maybe someone like myself, a psychiatrist that might need to prescribe a medication a pharmaceutical because that sleep is that important. I, I, like most of my colleagues, child psychiatrists at least, we don't prescribe Ambien or hypnotics to young people, but sometimes there are other agents like ones called Visteral or hydroxyzine. These are like antihistamines that are also helpful um, for sleep and sedation along with a handful of others that are not technically FDA approved, but sometimes we have to go outside those guidelines um, to make sure that a kid is getting continuous sleep every night. I think another also way to what can be beneficial. Oh, sorry, oh, Amar. No, go for it. Uh, I, think, I think what's also beneficial is there's a lot of great apps that help with sort of um, winding you down for the night too. And I know, I because I was like, don't use your, don't use your phone. Uh, but it's more like the app is like just music in the background. And there's actually a timer that shuts it off and the light does not, is not bright for you to see it. Uh, but it's called Insight Timer. And I know that's been a great app um, that's been discussed amongst my colleagues too as therapists that help uh, with sort of um, putting you in that zone where it's, it starts to help calm you down. It starts to help calm your nerves, especially with people that are so anxious already throughout the day with everything going on and everything changing. Um, so there's a lot of great apps out there that also help with sort of that meditation music or calming, soothing sounds um, that help induce that sleep. Uh, but the most important thing is just um, cutting off from anything that's stimulating. That's going to be the most important thing. I think for a lot of teens um, and for even just parents in general, they're constantly sort of um, waiting for what's going to happen next, what's going to be the next step, when, when are things opening up. Uh, and so in some ways, understanding that things will happen and unfold as they gradually should, uh, but your health is number one priority at this point, um, as we know, because you don't want to end up, you know, putting yourself in a predicament where you end up getting sick. So obviously taking care of yourself and self-care, like taking a soothing bath, um, going on a mindful walk, meditating, whatever that may be that helps you sort of calm you down, deep breathing exercises, there's a lot of great guided imagery, um, apps out there to help you as well that have been very beneficial when it comes to um, decreasing anxiety, especially to, towards the evening hours when it comes to um, getting into the zone to want to sleep. Amar, you were going to say something? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, just kind of piggybacking off of that a little bit. So there's an app called Headspace that does a lot of guided meditations and that we use even. And I think that it's been very beneficial for a lot of the teens just to kind of take a moment to decompress before we start our groups sometimes. And I've seen um, some of them, their distress levels drop, you know, three, four points sometimes just after doing that. But going back to also what Dr. Cena said about the routine, this is something that always reminds me of, you know, uh, being a child. And so having a child, one of the things that we want to do is we develop a sleep routine prior to them going to bed. Okay, now the TV's off. Now we're going to kind of slow down on some of the activities. Maybe we'll read a story. We'll take a bath sing a song and then get ready for bed. And I think it's really important that we have a routine like that. And as Dr. Cena said, this is something that happens like two, three hours before you go to bed. And so that we're kind of disengaging from the stimulating stuff. So the technology, uh, even as Prana was saying, some of the guided imagery or even going on a walk, things that'll sell it, settle us down. So, so it was worked for our children when we're doing those um, sleep routines early on. It works for us as well as adults too and teenagers. And I want to uh, piggyback on that. One more thing that's been particularly helpful for me for years now has been white noise. A white noise machine can be really beneficial. I remember growing up as a kid, I, I loved when the AC would turn on, especially in humid, hot Houston. <laughs> so it makes sense. I would love colder air coming to the room, but it wasn't that, it was the noise. Um, for me personally, and for a lot of other human beings too, the, that white noise helps kind of clear your thoughts, helps, helps kind of shut down the monotony of that noise, helps... Uh, um, helps uh, 
for a lot of people with sleep and with anxiety too, especially at night. So there are white noise machines you can purchase all over Amazon. There's ones that are specifically designed for sleep. There's some that we use as therapists and psychiatrists. There's one called Dohm, D-O-H-M. That's like one of the, the ones that's been around forever. It's like this little cylinder that you put on, on the floor. Um, there's other machines that have white noise and brown noise and pink noise and purple noise. And all these are basically fancy terms or unfancy terms for different frequencies. So some people prefer one frequency over another. And there's specific white noise machines that can do that. There's YouTube videos, free videos that you can all play for 10 hours in a row, like on a Bluetooth speaker as well. I personally have a HIPAA filter in my room that helps not only with allergies, but it's also, um, it's pretty, it's pretty damn loud. So it's, and which I prefer and it has different settings. So if I don't want it to be as loud, I can tone it down a little bit, but I, I literally can't sleep without it anymore. And I know I've had a handful of patients that white noise has helped them more than, than melatonin, than trazodone, than Ambien, and other types of pharmaceuticals too. So I have, I'll do two more questions. And the first one is about an 11 year old who is struggling with negativity and anger. Um, how do you suggest parents respond to kids who might be showing those kinds of emotions? So this is a really good question because I, like I had mentioned previously uh, in this webinar too, is that the way children display emotions in difficult situations are very different or similar in some ways as, as uh, adults do. And so what you'll see is sort of that regression sometimes happen, especially with children in difficult scenarios where they are gonna lash out in terms of anger or refusal to follow and comply with rules or sort of regressing in their age too and becoming extremely clingy or wanting to sleep in mommy and daddy's bed or whatever the situation might be. I think, again, what we have to look back is what are the basics? So. What are you noticing are their triggers? Are they saying something about school? Is it something situational that's happening in terms of not being able to see their friends? I think this is where parents sort of have to find a way to stay in the solution when it comes to hearing out the child to find out what's going on. Because a lot of the times, anger is sort of the easiest emotion for us to display as human beings, but underneath anger is typically hurt, sadness, um, and depression is what's probably going on. So I think this is where you start with having a conversation, you know, can you tell me what's going on? What's making you upset or what's, what's making you angry? If they're saying, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to tell you this is not, I don't want to say anything. Try to find a better time when they're not triggered or agitated to have a conversation with them and removing them out of the element, maybe going on a walk and then having a conversation with them about what's going on. Uh, it's pro it, in most instances, what we're seeing, especially with the younger kids, like 12 and below, it has to do with not understanding how to navigate this new world. And so also being mindful, and I know again, parents, we're all doing our best, but be mindful of the conversations that you're having in front of your children too. Because a lot of the times, what we may feel is not really a big issue to, that we're discussing could seem like a catastrophe to children. Like when they hear parents stressing out about the mortgage, immediately a lot of the, the children that I work with have said, does that mean I'm gonna be homeless? Does that mean I'm not gonna have a home? My parents will lose their job and you know, am I gonna have to get a job? And it's, it's, this is where children sort of tend to catastrophize what's happening when you just might be having a, an outspoken conversation you know, with your spouse or your partner, whatever that may be. So sort of being mindful of what those triggers look like is a good place to start. I don't know, Dr. Sina, Mar, you have um, some input on that as well? Yeah, it depends on how, how aggressive the behavior is getting, how negative, how angry. That, so we got to find out severity. We got to find out acuity, how long this has been on for. So we need to figure out some of these variables to see what kind of treatment this child may benefit from. Sometimes it may not require treatment and it's just more intervention. Like Prina said, find the right place at the right time to have a kid open up. A lot of teenagers, male and female, tend to resort to negativity, anger, aggression when they're depressed and anxious so, or stressed out. So like Prina said, I wanted to, um, to add to the, to the fact that kids, no doubt, will at times blame themselves, how maybe they're a burden to the family, how oh, I shouldn't even ask mom or dad for this toy or that clothes or anything because I overheard them talking about some of the economic issues. And right now, with I think we're having, what, 30 plus million people file for unemployment in the last couple of weeks. There's no doubt this is going to be a prevalent issue. And economic uncertainty leads to a lot of 
uh, destabilize, destabilization when it comes to just the way we perceive our own reality and the way we can cope. So we need, uh, what we need to do is just make sure that these kids know that they are supported, uh, but at the same time, um, defining that balance when it comes to uh, giving them not an illusion in that that we're uh, that they're that we're we're not scared. I think we need to be honest with them that we are worried too as parents, and at the same time be that pillar of support. And as a parent, extract yourself if you realize that you yourself are getting really negative or angry um, because kids are going to look up to you and potentially model your own behavior. I know a lot of my adult patients and parents in general are struggling with this too. So I think kids need to know that we're all in the struggle together, but that as parents, we are gonna be this pillar of support. And not only do we have to rely on our parents, thankfully we have schools, especially like you guys, that you're so thoughtful and engaged to be involved with um, hospital systems like our own. So it's not just the parents that are supported, but it's the, the schools, the communities, and healthcare workers too that have these children's back. And I think one thing also is, um what you'll notice as well that sort of comes with the anger is refusal to refusal to want to do anything i don't want to i don't want to do my homework i don't want to log into the zoom call i know i've spoken to a couple of parents where they've said their children or teens sometimes feel overwhelmed or even the younger children they don't really understand they're not really they're not really sure how to navigate this new world and so even in my own experience with my own child, she's refused to sit in on a couple of Zoom calls and saying, I don't want to do this. I don't want this is a hard mommy. And so this is where you really have to dig deep and validate how your child feels. But at the same time, can you sort of incentivize, incentivize you know, the situation too is, you know, what, what I did at home is we made a calendar of once things settle down, some activities we're going to do um, together as a family, you know, wh whether it's a, a trap planning a vacation, whether it's planning a, you know, an, a, a leisure activity, once things open, a favorite restaurant we're going to go to, what we're going to order. So that sort of helps bring some hope and insight that, again, the situation is temporary and the future, there is still a future ahead of us. There is, we can still make these plans for the future. Let's, how do we continue to be hopeful about this? And this is where I think it also helps instill hope for parents too, to say, I'm struggling too. I don't know how I'm going to pay these bills, but at least this is a good distraction for me. This is a way for me to engage and participate with my family, to have these conversations with them, to continue to say, okay, let's try to create some normalcy as best as possible. But that anger is, is going to be pretty typical because again, underneath the anger is what I think is going to be important for parents to understand is, is this hurt? Is this um, agitation? Is this refusal? What am I seeing and how is it being displayed when my children are being angry? And what are they angry at? What is the situation they're angry at? So that parents can get a better understanding of how they can then support their child too and have those difficult conversations with them. I, mean, I think the anger and negativity, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, new first. I was gonna say the, the anger and negativity like Prina is saying could be related to oppositional defiance. It could be related to depression, and anxiety. It could be related to ADHD, having a low frustration threshold. Sometimes, like we've talked about before, you have a patient who has like pediatric bipolar disorder that those symptoms themselves are going to lead to, or the diagnosis itself is going to lead to a lot of aggression and irritability on its own. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of times, like what's, thankfully, pediatric bipolar disorder is very rare, but it usually comes out as depression first before they have a potentially a full-blown manic episode. So I'm throwing all these diagnoses out there to just reveal that anger and irritability can be related to so many different underlying issues and that's why we need to do some investigative work especially with this one i believe you said 11 year old um, we need to figure out a little bit more detail to figure out how to help out the family and give them some pointers on what they can do to address those symptoms head on what are you going to say omar so i think one of the things just kind of really quickly to touch on is that when we are practicing that validation and asking questions and showing that we care and we're interested and coming from an empathetic standpoint and yes, sometimes they'll need some space where we don't want to follow and hover over them, but we want to be able to address these issues. We want to be able to talk it through. So um, one of the best things you could do is just kind of ask, I wonder if you're feeling kind of worried right now or scared or something that's going on. If they say, no, that's not how I feel, that gives them an opportunity to correct you too. And in correcting you, then you're going to get a lot of information and that'll help you make some more informed decisions in the future. Um, so I do think that's beneficial, especially because right now there is so much accessibility to like telehealth. And so if we are able to access that and understand a little bit more of what's going on, that gives us an opportunity to contact someone, a mental health provider who can start um, providing services at that point too. Yeah. So. And 
And so then the, there we got uh, quite a few questions and maybe we do something in August too as we as we head back to school no yeah. matter what it looks like but it's about transition. So um, it's a it's either a transition from a from a middle from an elementary school student to middle school who doesn't really end the year the way that you normally do maybe a transition into um, the college experience or just into the new school year, how do we help parents help their kids with those transitions? So, so I know in, based on just some research I've been doing is that um, a lot of parents are getting together just themselves with some of the other students in their classroom just to sort of do like a handoff or a send off or like a goodbye before they transition into the next grade. And I think this is a great idea because they get to see their classmates, I mean, obviously as best as possible, but also sort of maybe share in some memories that they experienced during their class time or um, one thing that they can praise a person for that they really enjoy doing in the classroom with them. I think this is something um, that I've noticed a lot of parents do, but I've also noticed in my own district of Saddleback um, that some of the teachers have talked about doing something like this as well as putting together like a send off or a goodbye or like a Zoom party, whatever they can do to give some closure possible um, for the students. With the, with the seniors who are probably looking forward to like tours at colleges and checking out the dorms, um, I know some of the colleges that I've, look, that I've um, been looking at as well is that they're doing virtual tours. So they're trying to set up sort of virtual campus tours, virtual dorm tours, where they have someone that they can speak to that can show them around and, and, and basically um, create as best of a situation as possible with them being in person, but it's happening online. And I think this is where, um, again, I don't wanna put more on parents, but it's like where parents and guardians and even talking to your, stu your, your children about doing some sort of send off yourself that you can create on your own too, is what can we do to come together as a community to, to give our children this send off um, as best as possible and as safely as possible. And it's, it's hard and it's, it's gonna be very hard to navigate and we can talk more in terms of what we're seeing as August approaches in terms of um, how the students are feeling in terms of the transition too and what has worked and what has not worked as well. Mm -hmm. I think that most schools also have like a type of committee that develops a lot of like, what is the dance theme? What is it gonna look like? What are yeah. we gonna do for graduation party? Things like that. I think that that's an opportunity also to utilize those committees to be able to kind of develop maybe some ideas uh, to be creative and how can we interact with all the other students who are in the same situation what can we do and then including you know some of the teachers what what would be a good idea to do this so like Brandon even said earlier just this is where creativity really starts to set in and um it's just going to take a whole village really to kind of work together to create these op or these experiences for the teens and even the younger ones too and then how do we help kids transition just sort of into the normal or what used to be normal daily activities I think it starts with having a conversation just to, just to identify fears. I think if parents are knowledgeable in terms of what their kids in, are scared of is, I'm scared of getting the virus. Okay, let's talk about that. Or I'm scared of um, you know, possibly exposing myself, not being sick, but what if I get you sick? Or what if I get grandma sick? Okay, let's talk about those fears. So before even identifying the scenario of what normalcy looks like is talking through the fears first to maybe help wean out you know, rational versus irrational thinking as well and easing their fears that way to be again in the solution and identify those solutions from the beginning. So that conversation should happen first before we fast forward to you know, what is it gonna look like when everything goes back to normal? Because you know, I know for our state, things are sort of rolling out in phases so almost identifying your conversation in those different phases. Okay, if we go back to opening up um, clothing stores and bookstores, what is your fear surrounding that? What is that going to look like? Well, if I try on clothes, I'm, I'm scared I'm going to you know, catch the virus or something. Okay, let's talk about that. So this is where parents can take that initiative and in speaking to their children when it comes to how the phases are being rolled out and what are the situations that they're going to encounter too. Um, I think kind of with that as well as like managing expectations. I mean, this is a situation that no one's ever dealt with before. Having those conversations firsthand is very important. Absolutely. And then also just kind of being aware of what are my expectations and what is realistic in this 
and so that I can be supportive to my children so that they know that they have someone to come talk to and that they're not fearing this idea of feeling ashamed or disappointing in any sense. So being able to manage that as well is, I think, extremely important. I agree. You know, these some of these transitions from a lot of human beings are, are going to be the most difficult times of their lives. So when it, whether it's going from middle school to high school, high school to college, so on and so forth. These are times that are particularly stressful for the average person, let alone someone who may be like, let's say on the autistic spectrum who already has a lot of issues with, with transitions anyways. So we just wanna make sure that, um, the, that, there, that these kids are supported and if parents are not able to supply the level of support that's indicated or necessary, thankfully there are doctors, therapists, there's programs like our own um, and I'm not trying to just plug Aspire, but I'm, I am really thankful that this program is still, well, I am trying to plug Aspire because it, it deserves plugging and deserves praise, um, not only for our staff and our team, but we're getting so much uh, praise from the parents and the kids who are so thankful that mm -hmm. there's somewhere that these kids can go to for two, three hours a day, just for socialization purposes, let alone treatment. So that's why, again, I'm so thankful to our team that th these uh, these clinicians are putting their health, their own lives on the line to help our children. And I know the community is super thankful. And so we're, we're there for our community too. And from what I've heard just from Prina today, we have a huge wait list of right when this COVID lockdown eases, there's a lot of pa parents who are thankfully preemptively looking ahead and be like, I know my kid's going to have some issues um, going into this transition, going to the summer, going on to the next school year. And thankfully we're, we're, we're setting them up for, um, for appointments so we can get them in ASAP because we, we want to help as many people as we can. And this is why we're sort of here to serve too is because um, you know our, our, our purpose is to address the teens and the, and the growing epidemic as we've talked about in previous presentations, the growing epidemic of mental health issues. You know now you know it's projected that mental health issues are going to skyrocket after um, COVID starts settling down. And so this is where we made the decision to stay open, to help support our community. And at the same time, it's to help support these teens because they really are struggling the most. Uh, teens, even children, even middle schoolers, they're really struggling with what's happening. And um, rightfully so, I mean, they're young, they're not, they're not uh, able to wrap their mind around what's going on. So knowing that there's a place that they can at least have that contact and that support is really important for them. Now, if you need even an individual therapist, psychologytoday.com is a wonderful website mm -hmm. to also check out where you can find therapists in your area that take your particular insurance as well and that specialize in certain subjects too. Um, and we encourage that, you know, like Dr. Sina has emphasized many times, you know, mental health is just as important as any medical condition that you would have too. I think now more so than ever, where we're all sort of, you know, for some people, they're more, they're quarantined all day with family. And it, it's sort of, you know, that everyone's getting a little bit tired of it, which is understandable too. Uh, but what happens after everything does start settling down and then you start sort of transitioning in between that transition is how are you taking care of your mental health? How are you taking care of your teen's mental health and what support do you need? So even if, if, if parents have questions, they can give us a call. We'll be more than happy to um, you know, get some providers to you too, or just answer some general questions that, that parents might have as well. Uh, because that's our, that's our goal here as, as a community-based hospital here at Hogue is to support the community, especially now more than ever. Um, we're being tested to do that. And we're, you know, luckily we're, we're passing that test with flying colors. Yeah. My, my genuine hope with all of this is that out of anything that comes from this, I hope that it buries the stigma for mental health ultimately. I hope this gives people a, an opportunity to kind of look at, okay, this is where now I can start to access these services that are out there and that other people are also accessing this because it's a need. It is an epidemic of sorts. Uh, you know, me mental health is needed uh, and that's why we're here and that we have these programs that are available and being part of this program has been one of the most enlightening and wonderful opportunities of my life where I've gotten to kind of get that feedback from the teens, especially right now, who are telling us, thank you for staying open. Thank you for letting us come and giving us an opportunity to kind of like talk and have that space. So um, luckily we are able to do that. And then for people who may be needing other types of resources and assistance, we've been happy to talk to people and give them um, different types of referrals or resources that are out there that are still continuing as well, just so that way we are part of the community and we want to make sure everyone knows that. 
Yeah. So even if the child may not be a great fit for our program, uh, we can still give other recommendations and referrals mm -hmm. to other programs or other clinicians that, that would be beneficial. So we want to be there for our community, especially now. And um, there's no doubt that there's going to be a skyrocketing uh, effect here where we're going to have more people that need access to mental health. I think another silver lining to piggyback what Amar was saying is that more clinicians like myself, I never did video sessions before this and majority of my colleagues never did either. Now we feel more comfortable doing these sessions moving forward. Um, and I know a, a lot of therapists, doctors, psychiatrists, psychologists feel in this, are in the same boat where it's going to provide more access to care for people who would have never had any otherwise. And so as we close, is there, is there a particular website or phone number that people should use to contact Aspire and Hope? Yeah, and we have um, two uh, numbers. So we have the Irvine location, which is probably more convenient um, for the Capo Unified School District. So Amar, do you have the main contact number that you can share? Yeah, you can just contact my, so we have two direct lines. So my direct line is gonna be 949 five five seven zero six seven seven um you'll get me and i'll be happy to guide you through the rest of the way um and i'm so the whole entire team here we kind of start go start to finish with everyone so we'll have the conversation early on we'll do all the assessments so you'll get to actually build quite a good relationship with us um in knowing that we're going to provide the best care possible as well um so and i know that the phone number for um for Newport, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is 949-764-4360? 6360. Almost. <laughs> Let's repeat it one more Better time. Base base. Yeah, it's, it's for Newport Beach. It's 949-764-6360. And so um, you can give us a call. We'll be happy to answer any questions related to referrals. What's the right referral? Um, you know, even information related to um, what kind of therapist, psychologist, psychiatrist, what's the difference? So we're more than happy to um, answer any of those questions. And like I said, um, Hogue being a community-based hospital, we're here to help and we're here to support the community. And that's ultimately always been our goal um, when it comes to our program. And that's why we also received our WASC accreditation too, is to help support teens. So there really is no excuse to say you can still get school credits and manage your mental health too. And then and the, the beauty of Hogue is, I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was to say the, the, the Hogue Foundation, compared to other Aspire locations, does uh, cover the cost of this um, of treatment if, for whatever reason, insurance companies pull the plug. So this is, in our opinion, analogous to a child who's getting chemo treatment that because they're doing better technically that we don't need any more chemo or radiation. That's just not the way we, we perceive medical health. It's not the way we should perceive mental health either. And so because we have eight weeks of two week modules that are so four modules total, uh, we want to make sure these kids graduate through all the modules so they can get as many tools as they can under their, under their, under their wings or on their tool belt. Um, and so what's great is that if the insurance does pull the plug, Hogue Foundation will cover the remainder of the cost if, if necessary. So that means every kid that joins the program is going to complete the program, regardless of insurance or not. Now, if they pull out because they're just they're, they're going against medical advice, that's a whole different story. But yeah. but thankfully, most kids <laughs> most kids don't do that, and most parents don't do that because over time they do see the they do see the benefits. And, and the website. Oh, I was just saying, what's the website exactly? <laughs> it's hogue.com forward slash aspire. And the name of the app to help wind down, can you mention that one more time? Yeah, it's called Insight Timer app and Amar had mentioned Headspace. So those are the two apps that we would recommend um, that I've used personally as well as a clinician that have been really beneficial too. And check out our website. Our website has a lot of great information as well, um, even from our other physicians, as well as our Aspire website too. It has a lot of great information too for you to be able to access. And like I said, don't hesitate to give us a call. We'll be more than happy to help. Yeah, I believe we're on Instagram and Facebook and we're at some, some point, the team is gonna make a TikTok video. If I had to yes. guess, <laughs> <laughs> we'll cross that bridge if we ever get to it. Um, the then, other thing I was gonna mention too, app wise is YouTube is a great resource when it comes to like personal trainers. There's a ton of people, uh, personal trainers that are having free videos online that you can just use gravity where you don't, have to, you don't have to have a ton of equipment at home. You can use different types of, um, and I'm not a personal trainer, but like lunges and pull-ups and push-ups and sit-ups and all these different types of activities that can also be really beneficial to stay active at home. 
Okay. And then there was also psychology today was mentioned as the place where people can go to find therapists. So I just want to make sure we mention that one more time too. Yeah. yeah that's, one of the biggest, that's one of the biggest directories. Yeah. It's one of the biggest directories. Um, I think in the in United the States, it's, yeah, in the country. So you can access psychologytoday.com. All you do is put in your zip code and it can give you a list of clinicians that are in your area that take your insurance and that also have um, particular specializations as well. Okay, Dr. Sina, Prana, Amar, I wanna thank you so much for doing this with us today. Um, I know it was probably within the last week or two that we planned this, just sort of knowing at this time what we needed. And um, it was definitely something that our parents needed. And I think all of us as parents need to hear too. So I just so appreciate your time. I know you're busy and the work that you're doing for our kids is incredible. Um, and, and we are just so grateful for it. So thank, thank you. So thank you thank for you the so opportunity. Much. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Have a great day. Okay, you too. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Take care.